Live from Case at 12. The news at noon starts right now. New at noon, a former Bear County Sheriff's deputy who was fired after being accused of illegally strip searching women has died. He was awaiting trial on five charges of kidnapping. Floyd Berry's death comes less than two months before his trial was scheduled to begin. According to an online obituary, the 52 year old died on January 30th. We are told he died of natural causes. Officials with the Bear County District Attorney's Office received formal confirmation of Barry's death this week. The charges against him were dismissed yesterday. Barry was arrested in December of 2019 after multiple women told BCSO investigators that he forced them to expose themselves during traffic stops or arrests. All, in all, five women came forward between the ages of 26 and 52 with complaints against Barry. BCSO officials fired Barry the following year while he faced multiple oppression charges. Prosecutors in October, though, refiled the case as kidnapping, which is a higher level offense. A murder trial underway today and opening statements are giving us insight into what led up to the shooting. Luis Alvarado is charged with the 2021 death of Santos Cedillo. The two were neighbors when a dispute ended with Cedillo being fatally shot. Testimony got underway in district court this morning. Opening statements revealed that tensions had been brewing between the two before the shooting. Video of the shooting was also shown to the jury today. Several witnesses watched it, including the victim's wife. Our court reporter Eric Hernandez will have more of that testimony and evidence shown later this afternoon. If guilty, Alvarado is facing up to life in prison. Convicted ex-constable Michelle Barrientes Vela back in court today, two months after being sentenced to her felony tampering case. Her attorneys asking for a new trial. Witnesses for Barrientes Vela testified that jurors were sleeping and coughing. And that is the reason her attorneys say the former elected official did not get a fair trial. Barrientes Vela is serving five years probation, also faces 90 days in jail once her appeals are exhausted. Judge Valia Meza has until March 22nd to issue a ruling on the motion for that new trial. We have some new information on a late night shooting from last night. We are learning the teenager hit by the bullets does have life threatening injuries. San Antonio police tell us the teen was in a car that was traveling eastbound on Burnett Road last night. This was near North Walters on the east side. At some point, a driver in another vehicle pulled up alongside the teen's car and started firing a gun. The teenager was hit several times. Then the suspect's vehicle sped off. Police are not only trying to find the person who pulled the trigger, but a motive for that violence as well. Outside with live cam, been one of them weird days. A little cool this morning, but humidity has set in along with a warmer temperature. It's just kind of yeah, out there. Yeah, icky. Good way to describe it. Yeah, they, and the clouds can't seem to make up their mind. They were away this morning. They've jumped back in and uh, now we're looking at mostly cloudy skies uh, with the sun's trying to shine through. So it, it's still going to be a warm afternoon. Temperatures are already making their way up near 80 degrees. There's a big temperature difference though, across the state. I want to show you that right now we're sitting at 78, but look just to our north, north of a stationary boundary. It's in the 40s, 48 in Brownwood, Abilene, Midland at 45. That cool air is kind of stuck there for now. It's not going to make it down here, not until Friday. And even then it's not going to be that cold. Uh, so really, as you look across the state of Texas, you got uh, cold stuff up north and then really warm stuff down to the south. And that'll be the case today and tomorrow. We're in the warm air, warm and humid air. And there's the look outside. Yeah, mostly cloudy at the airport. Dew point is at 63. And we've got a south southeasterly wind at about 11 miles per hour. Your case at 12 hour forecast. 85 this afternoon. We'll call it partly cloudy. 81 at 7 o'clock and then down into the 70s tonight. Clouds build back in and we may see a little bit of drizzle coming up tomorrow morning. Front does eventually make its way in on Friday. What does that mean for our weekend forecast? What does it mean for rain chances? We've had a few changes to the forecast. We'll talk about it coming up here in just a few minutes. Thank you, Justin. New at noon, a fire at an apartment complex sends one person to the hospital. Fire crews called to the 3400 block of Magic Drive. That's on the northwest side near the medical center. Firefighters say a mattress caught on fire this morning. As a result, there was some smoke damage to two units. One person taken to the hospital due to smoke inhalation. It's not clear what set that mattress on fire. Firefighters busy. San Antonio fire investigators have a lot of questions regarding a fire at a home in the Government Hill neighborhood. At the top of the list, what caused it? As Katrina Weber tells us, they say they're also trying to sort out who was in the home at the time. 
San Antonio firefighters didn't have to go far to help a neighbor in need. A home that caught fire around 7.30 this morning on Mason Street is less than a block from their Government Hill fire station. Crews were able to knock it down quickly. Still, the flames and smoke caused damage throughout it. Finding the answers to several questions, including how the fire started, though, would not happen as quickly. Fire investigators have spent a lot of time focusing on that front room. They say that's where they initially saw the fire, flames coming through that window. The mystery doesn't end there. Firefighters say when they arrived, they found one woman who told them she had escaped, initially saying she was the only one there. Later, they say they were told a second person, a man, had been inside the home too and was missing. Fire crews were not sure right away what became of him. They say they searched but did not find anyone inside the home. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. A special education teacher at New Braunfels High School facing serious charges. He's accused of having an improper relationship with a student, which is a second degree felony. Police say that 41 year old Bryant Shepard was seen having an inappropriate contact with a female student while on campus. After an investigation, New Braunfels Police Criminal Investigations Division issued an arrest warrant. Shepard was found at a San Antonio home and arrested yesterday. An improper relationship between educator and student charge could carry a prison sentence of between two and 20 years and a fine of up to $10,000. For the fourth time now, State Senator Roland Gutierrez presenting new gun reform legislation to lawmakers. He did so standing alongside some of the families of the Robb Elementary shooting victims. The Senate bill creates a ban on a type of ammo called expanding bullets, which cause more injury when fired. Also, SB 1736 closes gun show loopholes. SB 1740 expands gun storage and safety requirements. SB 1739 creates life without parole for school shooters. And finally, SB 1738 requires the automatic suspension of law enforcement involved in the shooting of a child, or as one family member calls it, Uzia's law. Since the start of this season, or session rather, Gutierrez and several of his colleagues have filed 21 pieces of gun reform legislation for the 21 victims. The deadline to file new pieces of legislation is this Friday. Still coming up, the Cowboys look like they're going to be keeping their quarterback for a long time. More on a Dak Prescott extension. The acting FAA chief in the hot seat following several high profile mid air incidents. What he is saying the agency plans to do now to make flights safer. The acting FAA administrator testifying on Capitol Hill today following a series of close calls at airports across the country. ABC's Jacqueline Lee explains how those close calls are now prompting calls for change. I'm taking over this plane. Terrifying moments on board a LA flight to Boston Sunday. 33 year old Francisco Torres is charged with trying to open an emergency door and assaulting a flight attendant. I will kill every man on this plane. There's going to be a bloodbath everywhere. Law enforcement sources telling ABC News that the suspect allegedly attacked two guards in the jail where he's being held in Rhode Island. Torres is accused of threatening passengers and trying to stab a flight attendant several times in the neck with a broken metal spoon. My daughter was very upset. Um, she was crying. For me, the fear was just that short five seconds of however long it took him to run down seven rows and hit that flight attendant. This coming on the heels of several close calls involving commercial flights as acting FAA Administrator Billy Nolan testifies on Capitol Hill. What the heck is going on in air travel? We have set a poly for a zero zero tolerance policy around unruly passengers. It is just simply not allowed. The NTSB investigating after last month, air traffic controllers at a Florida airport cleared an American Airlines plane to land from the same runway as an Air Canada flight was taking off from. The planes just 3,100 feet from each other. We've got to rebuild the system to build in more buffer to prevent incidents from getting even that close to disaster. In a call to action memo last month, Nolan said the safety review team will examine in U.S. aerospace system structure, culture, and processes. He is testifying before the Senate Commerce Committee today. Jacqueline Lee, ABC News, New York.
Looking outside with live cam, we got mm. mostly clouds today, a lot of clouds, and it's really muggy out there. Almost 80 degrees already? Yeah. Noon. Yeah, I know. I know, and everyone's asking, well, when's, when's the next change coming? Because it already feels like it's late spring, right? Uh, we do have a front on Friday that finally does bring some changes, but not a lot. I'll be honest with you. Uh, there are some small rain chances in our forecast, too, and we need it in the worst way. The aquifer's down a tenth of a foot again today, 635.6. And your pollen count, oak, jumped to the top of the list. It's in the high category for the first time this season. 560, hackberry at 130 and moderate. You got molds, mulberry, and ash also on the list. We look ahead to the weekend and spring break coming up. You know, we were talking yesterday about all the blue bonnets already starting to bloom, like above 1604, up 281. Pretty impressive when you see some of the pictures that some of the viewers are showing us, and when you just see them, because we hadn't had that much rain, but yet the blue bonnets are blooming. Yeah, it's true. It feels like they always find a way, though, here in Texas, right? Despite uh, despite some drought years, it does look beautiful out there. It, it's uh, pretty impressive. We've had some rain events this year, just not enough, not enough. Uh, we've got a couple in the seven day forecast that we want to show you. First, we start off with temperatures. And if you're watching at the top of the show, we explained the big difference between South Texas and North Texas. We're sitting at 78. It's humid. It's muggy. We've got 80s on the map, but you go just to our north in places like Midland, uh, Abilene, Brownwood. They've got temperatures in the 40s there. There's a frontal boundary that has stalled and it is just sitting there. It doesn't want to budge right now. San Angelo, they're at 50, but you go just a little ways down the road to Junction, it's 70. Uh, and this front doesn't make much headway to the south. It's not looking that way. It's again, just kind of stuck. Actually moves to the north, maybe a little bit coming up tomorrow. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to be stuck in the, the hot, humid side of things. We're not going to get that cool down until Friday, and it's not going to be a big one. We're not going to get 40s like what you're seeing there. It'll cool us down just a little bit uh, during the, the day on Friday. Uh, but it's 41 right now in Amarillo, 46 in Lubbock, 50 in Wichita Falls. Dallas is even on the cool side of things at 54. You get, at, to get down to Laredo and Brownsville, and you're talking mid 80s. A satellite picture shows we've got a lot of clouds stretching from San Antonio north. There's even a few showers north of that front. A few showers and storms up around the Metroplex. Other than that, it's uh, it's pretty quiet. And cloud cover here, interestingly enough, this morning we started off mostly clear. And as I've been saying the last few days, low clouds have a mind of their own. Uh, but in this case, we started off mostly clear. The clouds filled in, and now they're starting to break apart again. Uh, but the bottom line is that it uh, it'll be warm. We've had enough sun today to really boost the temperatures. We're at 78 right now. So dew point is at 63 and south southeasterly winds at about 11. Forecast temperatures this afternoon. We should be up around 85 or so. Most of us will be in the 80s, 88 pleasant, and there could be a few 90s on the map. Then as we get into tonight, into uh, tomorrow morning, some of that cooler air does try to seep down into the hill country. I just don't think it makes it all the way down to where we are. Uh, maybe Kerrville's affected a little bit down to 62, but we'll be in the mid 60s here in San Antonio. And then tomorrow, everyone's back in the 80s again, 85 here in town. So we just do it all over again uh, for your Thursday. Again, Friday is where we start to see some changes. Uh, so let's look at the forecast here and clouds build back in tomorrow morning. And then we break out the afternoon sun. Same old song and dance. This is four o'clock tomorrow. But as we get into Thursday, Notice at the top of your screen, there's a couple showers and storms. That's along the front. We're going to put in a 20% chance, but that's mainly for folks north of San Antonio. And this, this again is Thursday night. As we get into Friday morning, right along the front, there could be a few more showers, but they'll be few and far between. We're going to keep it at a 20% chance as the front comes through. And again, this is early on Friday. Uh, then by midday Friday, some cooler airs trying to uh, filter into the area. It'll be brief. It'll uh, take temperatures down into the 70s. So we'll have a high of around 74 on Friday, maybe a little bit cooler depending on where that cold air ends up. But that's that's what I think right now. And then by Saturday, we're back up into the 80s. Sunday is going to be a warm day before another front comes in. And this brings temperatures back down into the low 70s to start spring break. I would also point out that the mornings uh, next week are going to be a little chilly, at least to start. Uh, but by, I think, the latter half of spring break, things probably warm up some. 85 next couple of days, 
Uh, there's that cool down Friday uh, and then a warm weekend with some windy conditions on Sunday and then uh, we're back in the 70s Monday and Tuesday guys. Very nice. Thank you Justin. High school basketball previews coming up with a little history to boot and Dak Prescott talking contract extension. Some history at Veterans Memorial High School this past weekend. The boys basketball team made it to the UIL Class 5A state tournament. One year after coming up short in the regional final, the Patriots returned to Littleton Gym, defeated Corpus Christi Veterans Memorial 79-63. The Patriots boys basketball program was established just six years ago. They've only finished with winning records in the past three seasons. This year's group excited to get over the hump and earn their first state tournament berth. It feels good. It was a long journey. Uh, uh, I've said it's tough season. I always wanted to play in Alamo Dome, and now I'm finally doing it. It feels good. I think we just worked harder. We, we learned from last year, and we knew we were going to have to work harder because we lost seniors last year. We started the season one and three, and we, I think they said we won 34 of the last 35 games. So I think it's just like amazing to uh, become like, I don't know. Like, I think we overachieved, and I think we're going to continue to overachieve starting on Thursday. All right, Veterans Memorial will face top-ranked Dallas Kimball Thursday night, 7 o'clock, right here in the Dome. Let's take it to Brennan High School. The Bears getting ready to play Beaumont United in the Class 6A state semifinals. United won the 5A state championship last season and moved up to 6A because of realignment. Brennan 32-7, ranked 14th in the state. United 35-1, number two in Texas. A year ago, Brennan lost in the 6A regional final, coming up one game short of state this year they beat san marcus in the regional final to advance we're one of the first teams i bring to go to state football hasn't gone yet soccer we have great teams but uh just, just to be one of the first teams to go to state in this in this at this school is a great thing it's really exciting uh you know it's a first time experience for all of us we just got to play hard play fast and play aggressive you know play how we play it's true confidence there's nothing nothing fake or pretend about it they're they're ready to go and, and they've had a lot of experiences in the game against some really quality players and we're about to about to play some more of those so we're gonna see what we can make happen with it all right brennan will play beaumont united friday night seven in the dome just up I-10, the Bernie Greyhounds are hoping the third time is the charm. Last Saturday, they beat Stafford 50-32 in the regional final to advance to the Class 4A state playoffs at the Alamo Dome, earning their third straight trip to state. That's where they've lost in the semis final to each of the past two seasons by a combined 12 points. When did this year's squad know they were going to have another special season, though? Probably right when we got back from football. Uh, we have really good chemistry on and off the court, and so it was really easy for us to get back into it as soon as we started playing again. That Christmas tournament at, at, at home, uh, football kind of got, I think it was our fourth or fifth game back. Uh, everything kind of started to click. We were winning, some, winning games by a lot more than we were beforehand, so I think when that kind of started to happen, we kind of picked up and said, all right, just time to get back to where we were. As you can tell, a lot of great high school basketball action this weekend in the Alamo Dome. So Bernie and Houston are going to square up at 3 o'clock in the Class 4A state semis in the Dome. And the Dallas Cowboy quarterback Dak Prescott signed through the 2024 season. He's guaranteed $31 million for the upcoming year and is expected to restructure his deal to lower his $49 million cap to help the team bring in more talent. Dak signed a four-year, $160 million deal in March of 2021. Before his current contract expires, the Cowboys would like to sign him to another contract extension. While at a luncheon Dallas, in Dallas, Dak was asked about that extension. To be a Dallas Cowboy, as I said, I mean, um, always dreamed to be here. Um, now that I'm here, I don't expect to play for any other team. Uh, and now it's just about winning. Uh, so just trying to get that done. Um, and just to hear, obviously, as you say, in the front office, um, looking forward, forward to an extension. So when that time comes, it'll happen. Uh, I'm kind of uh, with Steven on it. It may just happen overnight. But uh, <laughs> when it happens, it happens. It'll be great. I'll see how it works out with a new offensive coordinator this year. It's also official that the Cowboys use their franchise tag on running back Tony Pollard, one of six NFL teams to tag a player, and there's really no surprise there. They needed to keep Tony Pollard really bad. Yeah. All right, coming up next, technology in the classroom. It's not a new thing, but some teachers are already incorporating artificial intelligence, and it's resulting in some high-tech lesson plans. How students like this new way of learning.
Two of the four Americans kidnapped in Mexico enjoying their first day of freedom on U.S. soil today after surviving a horrific attack. The video shows armed men loading the group into a pickup truck in Matamoros on Friday. Eric James Williams and Latavia Tay McGee made it out alive. The other two friends, though, did not survive. Williams is still in a Brownsville, Texas hospital. He was undergoing surgery for multiple gunshot wounds to his leg. His wife, Michelle, able to speak with him just briefly. It was just tears of joy, I guess, that he's alive. I didn't even want to imagine what what he was going through or, you know, what any of them were going through. Mexican officials now believe the shooting and kidnapping was simply a case of mistaken identity. A gunman may have targeted the vehicle because they wrongly believed the group of Americans were rival human traffickers. A 24 year old man was arrested in connection with the case. Mexican authorities say that he was in charge of keeping an eye on the kidnapped Americans. Meantime, back here at home, that violence in Mexico has some people rethinking their spring break plans. We spoke with an international relations professor at Trinity University who said it's OK to travel. Just make sure you are traveling smart. I was planning to go to Mexico over the spring break. Um, and I was not going to a border town, I would feel pretty fine continuing with my plans. Now, if you do plan on leaving the country, it is a good idea to check the U.S. State Department's travel advisories before booking any trips. Five women suing the state of Texas, saying that they were denied abortions despite facing medical emergencies that put their lives in danger. ABC's Marilla Villarreal explains why they are not trying to change the law, just get it clarified. Five women suing the state of Texas, Attorney General Ken Paxton and the state's medical board, alleging they were denied necessary and potentially life-saving obstetrical care because medical professionals throughout the state fear liability under Texas's abortion bans. What happened to the people standing behind me was a violation of their Texas constitutional rights. According to the lawsuit, Anna Zagarian's water broke just four months into her pregnancy, leaving the baby without any amniotic sac inside the womb. And they said, even with the best neonatal intensive care, a fetus cannot survive outside the womb at 19 weeks. My heart broke into a million pieces. Aborting is typically advised in these cases because the mother could face sepsis, a life-threatening condition that happens when the body has an extreme response to infection. When the amniotic sac ruptures too early, the risk of infection increases for both mother and baby. The child I was so excited for wasn't going to live, and I needed an abortion to preserve my health, but couldn't get one in Texas. The lawsuit, backed by the Center for Reproductive Rights and Abortion Rights Group, isn't asking for the state's abortion ban to be lifted. Instead, they're trying to get a judge to provide medical clarity on the portion of the law that allows women to get an abortion in emergency cases. For Lauren Hall, another plaintiff in the suit, that emergency came after her 18-week scan. The maternal fetal specialist sadly told us that our baby had anencephaly, a condition that causes a baby to develop with no skull and very little brain matter. She flew to Seattle to have an abortion. I love Texas and it kills me that my own state does not seem to care if I live or die. That was ABC's Marilla Villarreal. The number of U.S. infants who died from opioid overdoses is on the rise. According to a study published today in the Pediatrics Journal, 731 children under the age of five died of a drug-related death from 2005 through 2018. Researchers say some of these deaths came from the use of the over-the-counter medications. medications. The majority of these fatal poisonings were from opioids. The study doesn't say how these children were able to get their hands on the drugs, but does note that more than 40% of them were accidental overdoses. We may be past mountain cedar season, but the sniffling and the sneezing continues because there's new pollens attacking our lungs. And this year, they appear to be hitting us earlier than ever before. Waves of yellow-green tree pollen flooding the air and coating everything from car windshields to sidewalks. Oak pollen, the biggest culprit here, and it's pegging out in the high category today. In Atlanta, the pollen count climbed to extremely high range, which is the earliest it's done so in 30 years of record keeping. 
And then yesterday, the tree pollen count there doubled. In Washington, D.C., the first high tree pollen count appeared a month ago, hitting a record high for this time of the year. It comes after an exceptionally warm February in the south and the east. A report from the nonprofit group Climate Central found that allergy season has gotten longer on average since 1970. Very interesting. Does that mean more of that yellow stuff all over your car uh, and I your think, porch and everywhere? I don't know if it's more yellow stuff, but it's certainly a longer season. So we get it for a longer period of time. It's not what we would hope for. Yeah. Not, not ideal. No matter how you slice it. No, it's not good. Uh, and yes, uh, oak is high today. We're going to be exploring oak season for you and kind of timing it out coming up here in just a few minutes. But first, we want to get to a traffic alert here. We have some slowdowns on I-35 North as you get close to 410. Reason for that, we do have a crash there and it is slowing down traffic uh, for the folks getting off 410 onto 35 and also for northbound. 35 right uh, as you get to 410. So heads up, there's going to be some slow traffic there for a while as they get that cleared. Good news, that's the only thing on the map uh, this afternoon. So go outside for you, mostly cloudy skies and temperatures 78 degrees at the airport. South Southeast Julia winds at about 11 miles per hour. Dew point is at 63. Our case at 12 hour forecast today, 84 at 3 o'clock, 85. That's our high temperature this afternoon. And then as we get into tonight, still warm and muggy. We're still in the 70s, even around midnight. Clouds build back in. We could see some drizzle tomorrow morning. More warmth on the way before front brings some changes by Friday. We'll look at that. Plus, we have an update on the pollen and the oak season coming up here in just a couple minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. A wider range of chemicals have been discovered in the contaminated waterways near the side of that Ohio train derailment. Researchers from Purdue University sampled water from two contaminated creeks in East Palestine. After February 3rd's derailment, they say they identified more contaminants than reported by the state's Environmental Protection Agency, including one chemical that's a byproduct of burning that can cause coughing and shortness of breath. The team's findings have been sent in a letter to the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment and Public Works. The committee is holding a hearing on the train derailment tomorrow. After signs of slowing down, the eruption at the summit of Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii has officially paused after 61 days of volcanic activity. The U.S. Geological Survey posted the update this week saying lava is no longer flowing on the crater floor. That's where all that recent activity has been confined. Kilauea started erupting on January 5th after a nearly month-long pause in volcanic activity. Still coming up, artificial intelligence now becoming a part of everyday life. How some teachers are incorporating the cutting edge technology into their lesson plans. Federal regulators investigating Tesla, why they say the steering wheels could cause some safety issues.